World War is upon us. It has been unfolding in slow motion for years. The only question now is who will get blamed. Humans tend to view each stage of history in isolation. As a result they rarely see the chain reactions that build over decades. Until a flashpoint catches their attention. September 11th, 2001 was one such flashpoint. You could make the case that this was where it all began. There's some truth in that. But it's also an oversimplification. I mean, let's remember here, the people we are fighting today, we funded 20 years ago. And we did it because we were locked in this struggle with the Soviet Union. They invaded Afghanistan, and we did not want to see them control Central Asia. And we went to work. And it was President Reagan, in partnership with the Congress, um, led by Democrats, who said, you know what, sounds like a pretty good idea. Let's deal with the ISI and the Pakistani military and let's go recruit these Mujahideen and let's great, let's get some to come from Saudi Arabia and other places importing their Wahhabi brand of Islam so that we can go beat the Soviet Union. Of course the Dancing with the Stars version of the story. The US backed the Mujahideen in response to the Soviet invasion of December of 1979. You might want to run that version by Robert Gates, director of the CIA under Ronald Reagan and George Bush Sr and Secretary of Defense under both George W. Bush and Barack Obama, because in his memoir entitled From the Shadows, he revealed that the U.S. actually began the covert operation six months prior, with the express intent of drawing in the Soviets. Oops. And they still haven't learned their lesson. Speaking of Al-Qaeda, if you do a Google search for jet fuel maximum burning temperature, You'll find an article from popularmechanics.com informing you that under ideal conditions jet fuel tops out at 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit, and that steel melts at 2750 degrees. They go on to explain how it isn't a problem because for the towers to collapse, their steel frames didn't need to melt. Trouble is, the steel did melt. Of course little details like the laws of physics never got in the way of a good story. Oh by the way, did you ever find anyone who could credibly explain how a third building, World Trade Center Building 7, fell straight down at 5.21 p.m. that day though it was not hit by any plane? And did they ever explain how the BBC reported this event 26 minutes before it actually happened? Though I know what you're thinking. Maybe it was a green screen and shoddy editing, and that we can't confirm the actual time from that clip, or can we? Turns out there was a second clip that did show the time. 21 colon 54, that's 9.54 in England, 4.54 Eastern, 26 minutes before the building actually fell, but I digress. The invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan were not motivated by the fall of the Twin Towers, nor was the evisceration of your rights and privacy that followed. To say 9.11 was a pretext would be putting it lightly. About 10 days after 9.11 I went through the Pentagon and I saw Secretary Rumsfeld and and Deputy Secretary Wolfowitz, I went downstairs just to say hello to some of the people on the Joint Staff who used used to work for me. And one of the generals called me and he said, "Sir, you gotta come in. You gotta come in and talk to me a second. I said, "Well, you're too busy." He said, "No, no." He says, "We've made the decision. We're going to war with Iraq." This was on or about the 20th of September. I said, "We're going to war with Iraq. Why?" He said, "I don't know." <laughs> He said, I guess they don't know what else to do. So uh, I said, well, did they find some information collect connecting Saddam to Al-Qaeda? He said, no, no. He says, there's nothing new that way. They just made the decision to go to war with Iraq. He said, I guess it's like we don't know what to do about terrorists, but we've got a good military and we can take down governments. And uh, he said, I guess if, if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem has to look like a nail. So I came back to see him a few weeks later, and by that time we were bombing in Afghanistan. I said, are we still going to war with Iraq? And he said, oh, it's worse than that. He said, he reached over on his desk, he picked up a piece of paper, he said, I just, he said, I just got this down from upstairs, meaning the Secretary of Defense office today, and he said, this is a memo that describes how we're gonna take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq, and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran.
The best laid plans of men often go awry, but George W. Bush sure did try. Iraq and Afghanistan became quagmires, just like Cheney predicted. Do you think that the U.S. or U.N. forces should have moved into Baghdad? No. Why not? Because if we'd gone to Baghdad, we would have been all alone. There wouldn't have been anybody else with us. It would have been a U.S. occupation of Iraq. None of the Arab forces that were willing to fight with us in Kuwait were willing to invade Iraq. Uh, once you got to Iraq and took it over and took down Saddam Hussein's government, then what are you going to put in its place? That's a very volatile part of the world, and, and if you take down the central government in Iraq, you can easily end up seeing pieces of Iraq fly off. Uh, part of it uh, the Syrians would like to have to the west, uh, part of eastern Iraq uh, the Iranians would like to claim, fought over for eight years. In the north, you've got the Kurds, and if the Kurds spin loose and join with the Kurds in Turkey, then you've threatened the territorial integrity of Turkey. It's a, it's a quagmire. Obama picked up where Bush left off by toppling Libya and funding extremists in Syria, the precursors of ISIS. They knew the weapons were ending up in the hands of jihadists since at least 2012. They knew what would come next. A Department of Defense document from 2012, acquired through an FOIA request, shows that the U.S. government was aware that these fighters intended to form a caliphate, and that this conflict would likely lead to a proxy war with Russia and China. The Middle East was being balkanized. Every pocket of resistance broken up into bite-sized chunks, but it was taking too long. So Saudi Arabia invaded Yemen, and Israel did their part by repeatedly bombing the Syrian army. The most recent attack was in July. Oh, and Turkey helped too. It's been a team effort. In 2013, when the US-backed rebels in Syria got caught using sarin gas against civilians and the Western narrative fell apart, Russia became a diplomatic thorn in Washington's side. So like a true gambler who doesn't know when to walk away, Obama doubled down by backing the coup in Ukraine, installing a puppet government with extensive ties to the U.S. State Department, bankrolling their ethnic cleansing campaign in the East and blaming the entire mess on Vladimir Putin. All we hear is Russian aggression, Russian aggression, Russian aggression. But reducing Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya and Syria to rubble is about spreading democracy. But accepting the results of a peaceful referendum in Crimea, well that's just beyond the pale. The war on the Ukrainian front continued through 2014 and into 2015. Somewhere along the way, the preparations for an open conflict between the US, Russia and China were normalized and brought from the shadows. Open threats were leveled in full view. Coverage was predictably one-sided. We've been through this before. Weapons of mass destruction. Human rights. Russian aggression. New excuses. Same goal. If you want to start a war, the unwashed masses must be convinced to send their brothers, sons and fathers to die on the front lines. The specter of an external enemy must be etched into their collective mind through trauma, exaggeration and repetition. History must be whitewashed, twisted and cherry-picked down to a politicized nursery rhyme. At no point should the real motives or consequences of such an endeavor be discussed. It stands to reason that if we want to stop a war we must reverse this pattern. Let's start with a realistic look at the consequences. The United States and Russia alone possess a total of over 15,000 nuclear warheads, as of 2014, each of which are 10 to 30 times more powerful than those that the US used against Japan and Hiroshima and Nagasaki. During the Soviet era it was understood that a hot war between these two countries would inevitably lead to the use of these weapons, and would therefore be an act of mass suicide. This idea was so deeply ingrained, that it had its own acronym, MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction. In recent years scientists have realized that this should be taken as a literal truth, regardless of which side may suffer the most in the initial exchange. A nuclear war between just these two countries, utilizing only the weapons which are slated to be active after the implementation of the START treaty in 2018, would release over 150 million tons of debris into the atmosphere. This debris would block out the sun, dropping global temperatures between 8 and 30 degrees centigrade. Agriculture would become impossible, mass extinctions would follow, and our species would not likely be exempt. This is a mild description. We're not even touching upon the direct consequences of the blasts, firestorms, and radiation poisoning or the secondary deaths caused by exposure and disease. In this context you might be inclined to believe that the use of these weapons would be completely off of the table, that every effort would be made to reduce stockpiles and that no new bombs would be built. 
Unfortunately this is not the case. In recent years US strategists have begun to promote the idea of limited nuclear warfare, with a focus on tactical nukes. The idea being that smaller weapons are more effective because they are actually usable. This isn't just talk. Under Obama the US military developed the most expensive and most dangerous nuclear bomb ever, the B-6112. The B-6112 is a guided nuclear missile, the first of its kind, and its yield can be dialed down electronically for the desired effect. This capability has been promoted by the CFR as a means of preemptively destroying China's hardened missile silos. Apparently the Obama administration took these recommendations to heart, because Section 1063 of the NDAA of 2013 directed the U.S. Strategic Command to prepare a report assessing the capability of the U.S. military to destroy a network of tunnels in China, and the known hardened and deeply buried sites of foreign nations, with conventional and or nuclear forces. While Russia wasn't mentioned directly here, it should be clear that they are on that list. Those promoting this new stance claim that this is merely a new form of deterrence. But this line of argumentation, even if it were sincere, is fatally flawed. A preemptive nuclear strategy, especially when discussed in public, sends a clear message to those who are being threatened, that they themselves must strike first, and Russia and China do not possess tactical nukes, so their preemptive strikes would be full scale. Of course America's political establishment has a good reason to play chicken with all of our lives, and the future of this planet. The balance of geopolitical and financial power has been shifting, and not in Washington's favor. China's new Silk Road project, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, and outposts in the South China Sea, in tandem with the Eurasian Union spearheaded by Russia, are edging the United States out of the world's new center of gravity. Pivots have failed. Bilateral discussions have gotten nowhere. Sanctions have backfired. Trade agreements have stalled. Influence has eroded. Washington is running out of options, and time. The dollar-denominated financial system has peaked. This is the end of a debt super cycle, and of the petrodollar. The next leg down is going to be epic. The powers that be would rather tip the board than lose the game. They'd rather take us to war than to take the blame. And if you let them get away with it, that's just the beginning.